In this video, we're going to be looking at the different types of redox equations and how to tell if something um, is a redox reaction. So before we do that, I just want to review assigning oxidation numbers. So just a quick reminder based on the stuff that we've talked about in the previous vid videos. Remember that if you have an element that is by itself, that oxidation number is zero. So for example, Na, H2, Ca, any element that's by itself. If you have a monatomic ion, that means you have a single atom as an ion, that oxidation number is the same as the charge on the ion. So for example, H plus, oxidation number would be plus one. Cl minus, the oxidation number would be minus one. Fluorine is always minus one unless it is by itself. So whenever you have fluorine in a compound, its oxidation number is minus one. And then oxygen will be minus two unless it's in a peroxide and then it's minus one. Also, oxygen's oxidation number can change if it's with fluorine. So the first thing to always remember is that fluorine is minus one. If you have oxygen with it, then it might change, but usually it's minus two. Hydrogen is plus one, unless it's with a metal, in which case it's a hydride, and that's minus one. And then the sum of the oxidation numbers equals the overall charge, or it's zero if it's a neutral compound. So as we look at predicting products of redox reactions, there are some that you actually already know. You just didn't realize that it was redox. Decomposition. So if you have any decomposition reaction, those are redox. Typically, you have one thing breaking down into its elements, and its elements, those would have oxidation numbers of zero. Composition or synthesis. If you have two elements combining to form one compound, that's also redox. And then combustion and single replacement. These are all redox reactions in which the oxidation numbers are changing, which means you're transferring electrons. Now, net ionic equations, they make it easier to identify if you actually have a redox reaction happening. This is why AP always requires you to do net ionic equations, because this allows you to actually look and say, oh yeah, those oxidation numbers are changing. This must be a redox reaction. So for example, let's say that we have iron and it's reacting with nickel nitrate, nickel 2 nitrate. And then you form iron 2 nitrate and nickel metal. Well, if we write, rewrite this as a net ionic, we get Fe plus Ni2 plus yields Fe2 plus plus Ni solid. Notice this is very easy for us to see. It goes from 0 to plus 2 and plus 2 to 0. And so iron is oxidized to iron 2 plus and nickel 2 plus is reduced to nickel metal. So notice how the net ionic equation makes it much easier for us to see that redox is happening. Always keep in mind whenever one thing is oxidized, something else has to be reduced. They always go together. We're going to look at the activity series just to look at oxidation reduction. Remember the activity series, that's a list of metals that's in order of the reactivity of a metal. So the activity series actually lists in order of decreasing oxidation. So the ones at the top are very likely to be oxidized, and the ones at the bottom are not as likely to be oxidized. We can say that the metals at the top of the activity series are active metals, so they want to be ions. And the metals at the bottom, they're called noble metals. They do not want to be ions. They want to be atoms. So think about the activity series as um, how lazy they are. The ones at the top are very active. They want to be ions. The ones at the bottom are lazy. They want to be atoms. They don't want to have to put any work in. So a metal in the activity series can only be oxidized by a metal below it. So the metal doing the replacing has to be above what it, what it is replacing in the activity series. So copper is above silver in the activity series. So the copper will actually replace the silver and it'll give us our products. Now, if you need just a refresher on the activity series, take a look at 4.4 in your book. That goes all through the activity series again, and it actually shows you the activity series table. So still take a look at that just to refresh the activity series in your mind. Okay, so as we look at predicting products of redox, now there are some equations that we haven't yet discussed, and these take a little bit of practice. And so what you're going to have to do is you're going to have to be become you're going to have to become very familiar with these specific reactions. So to start, you need to know what substances are commonly oxidized or reduced, and how they are oxidized or reduced, what they're reduced to. 
This is why the table from the previous video that said these are the common um, oxidants, these are the common reductants you need to know and some that are fair game but you don't necessarily have to memorize, that table is now going to come into play. So it's going to be very, very useful. So here are some special uh, equations that you need to know. Now look at the net ionic equation just to make sure that you understand why it's redox. So combustion reactions. Okay? If you have a metal sulfide like magnesium sulfide and it reacts with oxygen, it makes the metallic oxide and it makes SO2. So here's the difference between combustion that you're used to. This is normally a hydrocarbon. Normally we have C and H and it forms H2O and CO2. Well now we just have a metal sulfide instead. So this is now Mg and O and then S and O2 together. This is redox. Chlorine gas, you have Cl2 that actually reacts with sodium hydroxide and you make sodium hypochlorite, sodium chloride, and water. Okay, so these are special redox reactions that you need to know. You have copper. It actually reacts with concentrated sulfuric acid. You make copper 2 sulfate, sulfur dioxide, and water. Again, these are redox reactions. You can write out the oxidation numbers if you don't believe me. Then you have copper reacting with dilute nitri nitric acid. Now, there is a difference between dilute and concentrated, so make sure you know the difference. So if copper reacts with dilute nitric acid, you make copper 2 nitrate, uh, nitrogen monoxide, and water. Now if copper reacts with concentrated nitric acid, there's a difference. The difference is you make copper 2 nitrate, nitrogen dioxide, and water. So know the difference between dilute and concentrated. You don't have as much oxygen being formed if it's dilute, you have one more oxygen being formed within the NO2 if it's concentrated. Now, if you need some extra practice with predicting products of redox reactions, I have three links on here. You have net ionic equations and redox. There's part two and part three. So it's a three-part series. It's another um, teacher going through uh, the redox and predicting the products. And you can fast forward through as you need. It just shows different examples of redox equations, and sometimes AP likes to throw these in. It's hard to tell if they're still going to throw in these predicting products of redox equations, but it's always good to know. It just requires some memorization. So if you take a look on the class website, I have these under the resources for our redox unit. Uh, but these are definitely, if you need extra practice, just take some time, fast forward through as you need, and uh, get whatever practice you need.